Well, if the Lord's been good to you, give God some praise in the house. I said, if God's been good to you, give God some praise in the house. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask that the uh, youth who are part of the uh, youth church experience, if you would come forth at this time, I'd be most appreciative. And I'm sure some of those who were dancing uh, were part of that experience. If you all would come forth at this time. Some of them are already gone to the other side, but those who are still here. Like I said, some of them were dancing. And the two on the farthest end, they're not part of me. Praise God. It's good to see you all here. You can come down, young people. You can come down as you all get ready to move out of the sanctuary into uh, the youth experience. We're thankful that God has blessed you to be here today, and we, we love all of you all uh, so very, very, very much. And I, I just want to, uh, I'm going to pray with you, and then I just want to ask a question or two. Uh, the song that the praise team was singing, uh, Jesus is Lord, and, and that's a, a fact. And every knee shall bow. And what was the rest of that? Do you remember? Shall confess. And that's a fact. There you go. Amen. Now, if, if, if Jesus is Lord and that's a fact, every tongue shall confess. Uh, and, and, and nobody's going to take that back. What does that mean to you? It means that you always, you always love Jesus and that when you love him, that can never be taken away from you. Okay, very good. Okay. And, and lastly, and lastly, um, if you had anything to say to your friends, be it at school or wherever they may be, about the Lord, what would you say? He's very gracious, and I'm thankful for that myself. That he's very gracious, and you're thankful for that yourself. Well, it is good to know him, isn't it? Isn't it good to know him? All right. Father, in Jesus' name, your blessings upon other youth as they move from this experience into yet another experience. Bless them and the leadership of the youth uh, department, the pastor of the youth, that together they will realize what you have for them for today. For the psalmist says that uh, God is the God of provision. And Jesus taught his disciples by saying, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. So today let them reap the daily bread that's theirs. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all as you move with the pastor of our youth ministry. All right. We have with us today one of God's most outstanding personages who's with us uh, on today. And I want to thank, first of all, those of you who are in the business of uh, cosmetology uh, um, and whatever area, uh, whether you are, are barbering or or you are making the hair, you know, like my head, so much, looks so much better. Um, one of the things that we have to understand in ministry is that 
what you do is extremely important. You may not be dealing with the spirit as I am, but you're dealing with the soul that can help the spirit. By that, if you make me look good, that causes me to feel well. And if I feel well, I can worship God so much better feeling well. So we are partners. We are partners. We are partners because we have to address the total man. And you help us to address the total man. I know I feel better when I feel like I'm looking all right. And when I go anywhere and I feel like I'm looking all right, I feel so much better. And you help so many of us look so much better. And we know it's not the exterior. We know it's the interior. But something about the exterior causes us to uh, take on a different approach to things in life. So we're glad to have you today. And we honor you. And they're going to give to you some things today to uh, hopefully show that appreciation. Um, so we're, we're excited. And they will come to you in a minute. The, um, we have with us today the uh, Bishop Rudolph, and he is here at my invitation. Uh, he is the Adjutant General of the Church of God in Christ. That, for those of you who don't know what that means, that means he ranks high. <laughs> that's, that's what that means. He is, he is the person who's responsible for the protocol of the Church of God in Christ and lets us all know what we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to be doing it, and unto whom. Um, he was here before, if you all recall, and we enjoyed the word of God that came from him. And I wanted him to come back again, and I asked him quite some time ago, would you come and speak for us Again, and he uh, concluded that he would. Amen. He's pastoring a church. He should, he could be at his own today, but he's here with us because I invited him to come. And I want you to listen to him when he speaks today. Also, I like to say he will introduce or present his wife. I'm not going to take that from him. I'll let him do that. And those who are traveling with him. But um, he is an outstanding, when I say that, I'm not building him beyond where he ought to be built. And he's not speaking for himself, I am. To me, he's an outstanding person in our church. I really do have an appreciation for what he stands for uh, in the things of God. And so he is a person who shares the chain uh, that I share the cross that I share. Uh, he has the responsibilities. He's a good family man. And most of all, he loves God, loves God's people. And he's here today because of that love that exudes from him. When the choir has finished singing, uh, you will stand and he will come to the holy lectern and he will speak to us as God gives to him. Praise God for a choir and then him. If you know you can call on the Lord, just put your hands together a little bit. Oh, yeah. Makes no difference what the problem Yeah. 
Put those hands together and bless the Lord. Good morning. Amen. First of all, I want to thank the Lord for allowing all of us to be here. And before you take your seats, I want to thank the Lord for your pastor and the first lady of this church. Come on, first of all, let's hear it for Bishop Jerry L. Maynard. Amen, the pastor of this church. And also, let's hear it for Dr. Mary Maynard. Amen. Now, before you sit down, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. When I was growing up, my father was a district evangelist, and he loved to go to the various churches in the district. Evangelism was a part of his heart. And uh, what he would do is we would drive to a lot of places, and Arkansas is a very rural state. And we would drive to a lot of places, and uh, this was back before uh, GPS, back before the navigation systems. And some of these places, we didn't really have a whole lot of lights. That's literally how it was. And so um, I might stop in a town and ask a question. I would say, I never have a problem asking questions. And I would say, could you tell me where the Cathedral of Praise Church of God in Christ is? And they would kind of look at me. They didn't know the, the church by the name. And then I would always give the name of the church, and they didn't know the, 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 the church by the name. And so my dad just got frustrated one day. He said, boy, why don't you just ask them where the sanctified church is? <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, I've always been formal, so I said, I, I don't think that's going to work. But I found out that that worked because when I asked where the sanctified church was, People say, oh, yeah, that's Elder So-and-So's church. You go down the street, you make a right, you, you cross the tracks, whatever, you're there, right? I came here, um, and, and I just want to know if, if anybody in here knows anything about the sanctified church this morning. Come on, don't fool me now. Don't fool me now. The word sanctified means being set apart. Any, anybody know anything about being sanctified? Come on, put your hands together and say, glad I am sanctified come on put those hands together and bless the Lord amen if you would hold somebody's hand as we go to the Lord in prayer father I want to thank you Lord for this opportunity to come before you here in Nashville Tennessee to minister a word to this church and to these people God first of all I ask that you would grant me precision diction and clarity so that my words will go forth and everybody in the house will understand what I'm talking about on this morning. Then secondly, Lord, I ask that you would touch somebody's heart. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they're dealing with. I don't know what the situation is. But God, I ask that you would touch somebody's heart, that they would want to be delivered on this morning, that they would want to be saved on this morning. And then most importantly, Father, I ask that you would just hide me behind the cross. Don't let them see Rudolph. Don't let them see me, but let them see you and you alone. In Christ's name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, I'm so thankful to be here on today, and I am so happy um, that uh, there are a few people that, that came with me. Uh, first and foremost, I, I want to express my appreciation to a couple that came with me and my wife, uh, brother and sister Thorne, and I know they're here in the audience. I just want them to stand. They came here. They, they serve and, and work with us in, in the ministry. Brother and sister Thorne, if you would just stand and just, just wave. Amen. I, th I thank the Lord for them for coming here to be with us. And then, brothers and sisters, I am happy to be married. I really am. And uh, we haven't been married for 40 or 50 years like many couples that we run across. We've just been married. We, we would be married 
uh, 15 years in June of this year. And so I want to thank God because God has blessed me with a, with a jewel in my life and a jewel in the ministry. And she's always pushing and backing me throughout everything that I'm dealing with, particularly this, this position that I was given back in January to serve the national church in the area of protocol. And I want Lady Rudolph, Lady Michelle Rudolph, I want her to stand and I appreciate her. Help me to appreciate her on today. There's a long story, but she has been in love with me since she was 14. That's a long story. I got, we got to tell you the story. Now, I, you know, I was a little slow. I didn't catch on at first. I didn't catch on, but I figured it out when I was about 30. I figured it out then. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, let us go. Let us go to the word of the Lord. If you would, go with me to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. This is the Lenten season, and we're in the process of studying the life of Jesus Christ and a lot of times during the Lenten season, what we do is we take something that we have some issues with in our lives. Anybody in here have some issues? We have some issues in our lives. And what we do is we put it before the Lord during this time of Lenten season. It's a time of repentance. It's a time of going back to God. And, and this is one of my special times of the Christian calendar because it gives me an opportunity to see some areas where I need to come up. It doesn't matter if you're bishop. It doesn't matter if you're pastor. That stuff doesn't matter. Uh, what's most important is your relationship with the Lord. And, and sometimes in all of your positions and in all of your activity, you might along the way not do the things that you used to do as it relates to the Lord. Amen? And, and so what I do is during this particular period of time, I just, Lord, you help me. Lord, you bless me. Lord, you, you help me so that I can come up to where I need to come up. Anybody with me on that today? If you would, stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. If you would, stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. And this is what it says, Psalm 103, Psalm 103, verses 10 through 14. The Bible says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. I want to put special emphasis on verse 12 where it says, as far as the east is from the west. As a matter of fact, repeat that with me. As far as the east, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now come on, say that again this time, but don't say it because I've asked you to say it, but say it like you really mean it. Can you help me do that? As far as the east is from the west. So far, so far hath he removed, hath he removed our, transgressions our transgressions from us. Now put your Bibles down just for a second. Put your Bibles down for a second. And I want you to grab hold of somebody. And uh, please, please say it with some gumption this morning. All right? Say it like you're in control of something. Say it like you're in authority. Is that all right? Come on, I want you to say, neighbor. Let it go. Matter of fact, two or three people, just tell them, let it go. Let them go. Just, just touch them. Tell them, let it go. Let, come on, let it go. Let that mess go. Let it go. One more time. Come on, help me say it. Let it go. You may be seated. Let that mess go. Throughout the years, brothers and sisters, I have heard a lot of sermons on forgiveness. And we are told that we are to forgive others as Jesus has forgiven us. 
we are also told that we are supposed to forgive and forget the evils others have perpetrated against us. But one sermon that I have not heard a whole lot of, it deals with another part of forgiveness. And brothers and sisters, it deals with forgiving ourselves. I believe that one of the most difficult things we can do is to forgive ourselves. We know we are supposed to forgive other people, and sometimes it's hard to do. But we can usually come around to doing it. Forgiving ourselves is a different kind of issue. Now, we are the ones who has, we have hurt other people. We are the one might, who might have felt like we failed as a parent or as a husband or as a wife, and, and we might have allowed ourselves to be abused. And many times we know we have done wrong and we've hurt other people, and we have destroyed the lives of others, other people. But a lot of times we want to hang on the guilt of the past, and it's time for us to let it go. When we have sinned against other, other people, it's very hard for us to feel like we have been forgiven. Because one of the things that, that demands us or that bothers us and overtakes us is the guilt. It drags us on for a lifetime. And I want to tell you that the enemy has a way of allowing guilt to destroy what you're supposed to do for the future. You can't go forward if you don't erase your past and the fact the things that you have done made you feel guilty, but you've got to let it go. Even the Bible says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. In other words, whenever you reach, you've got to move. You can't stay in the same position and reach for something else. Matter of fact, just try it right now. Come on, just reach. When you reach, you ought to move from the position that you're in to another position. When you reach, you move from the mindset that you're in to another mindset. When, when you reach, you leave where you are and you go to another area. And, and so today, what I want to talk about is, is I want to talk about just forgiving yourself. I want to talk about you erasing the mess of the past. I want to talk about you erasing the guilt of the past. Well, in order for us to do that, there are several things that we've got to do. One of the first things that we have to do in order to forgive ourselves or in order to erase the problems of the past. First and foremost, brothers and sisters, I found out that in order to be delivered from people, and, and that's one of the things that I'm praying about during this Lenten season, because the, cult the church culture tells me that uh, I have to do what you want me to do. The church culture tells me that I have to please you or, 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 or not consider myself. But what I'm beginning to learn is that I am trying to be delivered from other people. I'm trying to be delivered from what other people say about me. I'm trying to be delivered from what other people do against me. I'm trying to be delivered, but in order for me to be delivered from that mindset, I have got to adjust my thinking. Everybody help me say, adjust your thinking. And one of the first things that I've got to do in order to erase the past is I've got to adjust my view of God. Please tell your neighbor, neighbor, adjust your view of God. Well, now, here, here, here it goes. One of the things that I believe keeps us from allowing us, ourselves to be forgiven is the fact that we have some wrong views about God. Uh, uh, if you're going to forgive yourself, you must first adjust our view about God. Now, now don't get scared. Don't think I'm going to come with some kind of great off-the-wall philosophy. No, I'm not going to do that. But what I am saying is, is that a lot of times we got to realize that God is not what we think he is. One of the first things we got to understand is that God is not a cruel judge. The Bible tells us he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. In other words, God has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. God is not a cruel judge. Had he been a cruel judge, if he had been a cruel judge, everything that you had done from the time you were a child up until now would be counted against you. Now, please understand, I know you're here in church now, and, and I do understand that you look real good right now. 
and, and I mean you are together this morning, but please understand that everybody does have a past. Now, I, I know you're holy now. I, I know you're sanctified now. I know you look good now, but, but just a few days ago, maybe some of us even this morning before we came in, we, we, we really didn't have it the way that we should. And, and, and so what we got to understand is that God has taken all of that. He has adjusted our view of, or excuse me, he has adjusted his view of us in our lives. Now, you can only admit that if you only admit the fact that you haven't been saved all your life. You haven't been holy all of your life. You haven't been sanctified all of your life. And, and so please understand that the wrongs that we have done, God is not just there to be a cruel judge and to say, there, you've done this wrong. There, you've done that wrong. There, you've done that wrong, and I can't forgive you. But the Bible tells us that Jesus wants to do everything good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, God's not just there to hold things against you. Now, that means that I'm so glad that you're not God. I'm so glad that you're not God. Because if you were God, if, if, if I did something against you, you would do something against me. If you were God, whatever I've done in the past against you, you will always remember it, and, and you wouldn't be fair with me. But the God that I serve, <laughs> the God that I serve, he is not a cruel judge. He is not sitting there saying that because you did this, I'm going to do that. But the God I serve says, I will judge you according to what you have done. But there is a grace dispensation. Hallelujah. How many people are happy for grace? How many people are happy for grace? How many people are glad that the blood of Jesus washed all of our sins away? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank God because the blood has allowed God not to be a cruel judge. The blood of his son makes everything all right with me regardless of your past. Then the second thing, you've got to adjust your view of God and knowing that not only he is not cruel, but brothers and sisters, God is not an accountant. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you, accountant is someone who keeps the books for a business. God doesn't keep the books on you like we keep the book, books on other people. When we belong to Jesus, God does not keep a record of your sins so that he can extract payment from you in the future and, and say that because of what you have done, I've got to reach back in your past and throw this in your face. I've got to wash your face with this. No, that's not what God does. What God does is, is once the sin has been forgiven, once you have agreed to change your life, once you have agreed to change your disposition, God forgives you and that's that. I can't help the fact that other people remember God forgives you. I can't help other, the, the other reason why some people want to do certain things and bring things up in your past. I can't help that because God forgives you. And, and so please understand that God is not a legal accountant. Neither is God a cruel taskmaster. In other words, God's not going to put things on us that he knows we're not ready for. No matter how deep we want it, no matter how bad we've got to have it, the God that I serve what he does is, if you walk according to his will, if you walk in his will, God will not allow things to happen to you that you can't handle. Brothers and sisters, the God I serve is not a cruel taskmaster. In other words, he's not just going to put me out there out to sea and I can't swim. He, he's not going to just throw me in a situation that I'm not used to. The God that I serve will walk with me and talk with me and help me through this. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost is our guide. He is our comforter, and he helps us to get through everything that we're dealing with. Oh, thank God for the blood. Come on, thank God for the blood. Thank God 
for the blood. So first of all, adjust your view of God. God is not somebody bad that throws you out to sea. God is not somebody bad that, that wants you uh, to fail, but God wants you to succeed in this life. Amen. Second thing I want to bring to your attention is that you've got to accept the forgiveness that God offers you. Please look to someone and say, accept the forgiveness that God offers you. Hallelujah. Look at this. If God gives you something, accept it. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to think, why is he being so good to me? I know sometimes we've been so beaten down in life that when something good comes our way, we, 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 we phantom and wonder why in the world is God allowing this good thing to happen? Many people have been in and out of relationships with other individuals and they have been pushed down for so long that it seems like they go back to the same relationships because that's all they're used to. Well, when God has been good to us, when God has been kind to us, we've got to accept the forgiveness that he has offered us. The Bible tells us that God has removed our sins from us. If you look in verse 12, it, it tells us we're told that God has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. He has removed our sins. I want to let you in on a little something. The east and the west, they never meet. Some of y'all will catch that tomorrow. The east and the west never meet. So in other words, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Why should you carry what God has already taken from you and giving it to Jesus. Why do you want to pick something back up that he has already forgiven you from? Why do you want to reach back into your past and say, you know, this is where I was? It's simply because the enemy has defeated us in our minds. The enemy has messed us over in our minds. The enemy has said to us that we shouldn't be doing the things in church now because of what we used to do many years ago. Well, I'm here to tell you that the devil is a lie. I said the devil is a lie. The enemy is a lie. Just because I did something in the past doesn't mean that you have the right devil to come and pick it up and, and, and allow it to be in my face again. You've got to understand that if God has forgiven you, if God has forgiven you, he is finished with what you have done. Come on, he is finished with what you have done. The Bible tells us that it's God, God's job to forgive us, and it's our job to accept it. Just accept the forgiveness of God. But, Brother Rudolph, you don't understand. Just accept the forgiveness of God. Brother Rudolph, you don't know what I've been through. Just accept the forgiveness of God. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that not only has God forgiven us, but that God has forgotten our sins. Oh, he has forgotten. Now, now, that's why I'm glad that many of us are not God. Because no matter how many years ago it might have been when we did something, there's always somebody. There's always somebody that remembers the stuff you used to do. There's always somebody that remembers when you did this or when you did that. But what I like about God is that God forgets what you've done. He started everything all over again. Bless his name. He, he has started everything all over again. In other words, brothers and sisters, I've forgotten it. God has forgotten it. So what is it of your right and your responsibility to bring it up again? Yeah, I know. I know you might have been in the club when the bullet went past your, your, your ear. I know you might have been so drunk that you probably could have gone to jail that night because you were driving while you were drunk. I, I know you might have had a past in drugs. I know you might have had a past in so many other things. But the God I serve, the God I serve, the one that woke me up this morning, the one that got me started on my way, the one that gave me a new lease on life, he has allowed, he has forgiven me and on top of forgiving me, I'm going to accept the forgiveness that he has given 
to me. Come on, put your hands together and bless the Lord. Now, here's the last thing I want to tell you today, and that is, not only should you adjust your view of God, not only should you accept his forgiveness that has been offered, but brothers and sisters, the last thing I want to tell you is that you've got to start enjoying your freedom. Oh, yeah, you've adjusted your view of God. You, you've done that. You know that God is not just going to beat you upside the head. You know that God is just not going to kill you. He's just not going to hurt you for the sake of hurting you. You understand that God is not a cruel taskmaster. And then now that he has forgiven you, you accept his forgiveness. But one thing that us saints really don't understand is that when God has done all, all of that for us, I'm going to sit back and enjoy my freedom. Now, how many people have ever been bound spiritually, mentally, emotionally? Come on, don't fool me now. Spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, you have been bound. But the God that I serve, the God that I serve, the God that I serve says in Romans, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Come on, tell somebody, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Tell them, I'm free. Now, God has died. Jesus Christ died and went through the things that you didn't have to go through so that you can be free. And, and, and one of the things that I have to learn and that, that I'm learning now and being delivered from people is that you got to understand that there are some people are, who are jealous of you. I can't hear nobody this morning. There are some people that are jealous of you. There, there are some people that want what you have they see your new car. They, they want it. They see your husband or your wife. They want it. They, they see the good job that you have. They want it. And so some people are jealous of what you have. They don't know what you went through. They don't know how you had to deal with whatever. They don't know how you got from point A to B. They, they, they don't know how, how you just left the hoopty and you got a brand new car. They, they don't understand that. They... They don't know when you, they didn't know you when you only had one suit in the closet. Come on, somebody. That they, they didn't know you when you didn't have anything. And so now they are jealous of you because of what you have. But one of the things that I have learned, and, and watch this, one of the things that I have learned, I'm not going to allow anybody to stop me from enjoying the blessings of God. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Yes, I'm going to be meek. Yes, I'm going to be humble. Yes, I'm going to be thankful to the Lord for what he has done. But I'm not going to walk around with my head down just because you have a problem. Because you have a problem with what the Lord has done in my life. You, you don't know how many tears that I have shed to get to this point. You, you, you don't know how many problems I've had to deal with in order to get to this point. You don't know how many times I've served in order to get to this point. You, you don't know how many doors, praise the Lord, have been closed in my face. You don't know. So because God's favor is upon me. Mm. Come on, somebody just put your hands together and thank God for his favor. Come on and thank God for his favor. Come on and thank God for his favor. Come on and thank God for his favor. So let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, I'm not going 
I, I am going to adjust my view of God. Oh, yes, I am. I, I'm going to accept the forgiveness that he has given to me. Oh, yes, I am. And I'm going to enjoy my freedom. Now, now, I, well, one of my favorite, one of my favorite people in the Bible, it was a man by the name of David. Y'all know who David was? The Bible tells me that before David was favored publicly, he had favor with God privately. Because the Bible tells me, and he wrote this psalm, the Bible tells me that when the prophet came to his house in order to uh, anoint the next king of Israel, David wasn't even brought to the house. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? David was out in the field. And what David's father did, once he received the word, y'all with me, y'all with me? Once he received the word that, that, the, that the prophet was coming to anoint the next king of Israel, I, I'm quite sure that he got all of his sons except for David. All of the boys that look good. All of the boys that were favored in his eyesight, all of the boys that he thought would be the king, he got them cleaned up, and, and he put them in front of the prophet. But, but there's something about a blessing that you're not favored to have. Mm. What I found out, can, can y'all get with me just for a second? What I found out is that a, a blessing is not meant for you to have it. It doesn't matter how many times people have been pushed in front of you. Do I have a witness in here? It, it doesn't matter how many times people have been, have moved you to the side. It doesn't matter how many times people have, I mean, just literally kick you out of the way. Oh, bless his name. Come here, Bishop Maynard. It doesn't matter how many times people have put you to the side. When the time comes for you to receive public notice, I wish I had somebody in here this morning. I said, when the time comes for you to receive public notice, God has a way of bringing you from the field where you've been serving him patiently. I can't help, come on somebody. God has a way of reaching out to the field because even though David wasn't in the room, even though David wasn't in the presence of the prophet, Thanks be to God that the oil didn't flow. Don't worry. Don't worry about other people getting in front of you. Believe me, the oil won't flow. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, don't worry about those folks who are trying to get in front of you. Because the oil will not flow. The Bible says son after son came in front of the prophet. Son after son came in front of the prophet. But the Bible says that the oil did not flow. It got so bad that the prophet said, now wait a minute here. I know God sent me to anoint the next king of Israel, but I don't feel his anointing. Do you happen to have another son? Look at somebody and say, is there somebody else around that has a relationship with God? The Bible says, as a matter of fact, I do, but he's a little ruddy boy. And you really don't want him. No, no, no. Look here. I'm not going to sit down until you go and get him. But the moment they brought David in, the Bible says David stood in front of the prophet 
and he began to pour the oil. And he didn't have to pour the oil because the oil began to flow. I'm here to tell you no matter, no matter how people try to dissuade you, no matter how people try to put you out of the way, the Bible says that God will allow the oil to flow. What's for you? Tell your neighbor what's for you is for you. Come on, tell them like you mean it. Neighbor, neighbor, what's for you is for you. You keep praising him. You keep thanking him. You keep giving him glory because God, God will work it out every time. Fast forward a little bit. The Bible says the children of Israel, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into the city of Jerusalem. And, and, and the Bible says that David was leading the procession. David was dancing in front of the Lord, so much so that his clothes fell off of him. Oh, that's some heavy-duty shouting right there. He was praising and jumping and dancing before the Lord because God allowed the, the Ark of the Covenant to come back into the city of Jerusalem. But he had problems in the house. The Bible says that his wife looked out of the window and, and she looked at him when he came in the house and she said how glorious was the king of Israel today as he shamelessly uncovered himself in front of his subjects and in front of all of his people. But that's where David did something that you can do when you're delivered from people. I said that's when David did something that you can do when you're delivered from people. What David did, he said, woman, and I'm going to paraphrase. He said, woman, look, I'm not praising God because of you. When you're delivered from people, come on, tell your neighbor, when you're delivered from people, when you're delivered from people, you can say, I'm not praising God because of you, but I'm praising God because when I had a relationship with him out in the field, when nobody knew about the lion I killed, when nobody knew about the tiger I killed, when nobody knew about the bear that I killed, I was developing a relationship out in the field. When I was tending over the sheep, I began to get anointed and I began to sing praises unto the Lord. Nobody knew about what I did out there. So how dare you come into my house while I'm praising and magnifying the Lord. In other words, David said, look, woman, the next time I praise him, and matter of fact, let me remind you that I'm not praising him because of you, but I'm praising him because God made me king when your father was acting up, when the spirit of the Lord was leaving him. God anointed me the next king, but I had sense enough to go somewhere and sit down and praise God and just wait for it to happen. I'm here to tell you that God has promised you a whole lot of things, but you can't tell everybody your dreams because there are some dream killers out there. And, and so every now and then, every now and then, you have to just keep your mouth shut and just keep praising God in your closet. Keep praising God in your room. Keep praising God in your car. Keep praising God at your workstation. And say, Lord, I know it won't be long now because you promised me that everything would be all right you promised me that I was going to be the lender and not the borrower. You promised me that you would go before me. You promised me, you promised me that I would be blessed on the left and I would be blessed on the right. As a matter of fact, you promised me, you promised me that I would be blessed in the city and I would be blessed in the field. You promised me, you promised me, you promised me that everything would be all right. And I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you because my blessing is around the corner. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to thank you because it's going to happen. 
Come on, somebody. God said that the blessings will be all around you. God said that the blessings would overtake you. Oh, come on, somebody. God said that the blessings would overtake you. I'm tired. I'm ready for my blessing to overtake me. Holy Spirit, let your blessing, let your glory, let your blessing overtake me now. Overtake me in the midst of what I'm doing. Overtake me in the process of what I'm going through. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I need you now. Help me, Lord. Come on, put your hands together and bless the Lord. Come on and bless him. Come on and bless him. If you want to be delivered from people, just begin to bless him. Come on and bless him. Come on and bless him. Come on and bless him. Now look, I told you what I was going through. I told you what I was praying for that during this Lenten season. I want God to help me to be delivered from people, to be delivered from attitudes, to be delivered from other people's opinion. Just because of the culture that I was raised up in, I was always concerned about other people. I'm still going to be concerned, but I'm not going to let their opinions of me stop me from doing what God has favored me to do. Oh, put your hands together and bless him. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. The Bible says, the Bible says that God has removed our sins from us. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. Tell your neighbor, get over it. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Whatever you're holding on to from your past, let it go. Let it go. Some of us might have been murderers. Some of us might have been adulterers. Some of us might have been fornicators. Some of us have gone through all kinds of things. But the moment God came into your life, all of that stuff is gone. And the only reason why the enemy is jealous is because you have a right to be where he's supposed to be. Lucifer was made to praise and to worship and to magnify God, but he got the big head and thought that he was just a little bit higher than that. He thought that the praise team wasn't going to sing unless he came and he showed up. Come on, somebody. And him and a third of heaven were kicked out. Hell was specifically made for Lucifer and his angels. And he's jealous because the Bible says that God made you not to look cute, not to look pretty, but he made you to worship him. And so you have an opportunity to do what the enemy can no longer do. I don't know about you, but I'm somebody special. I don't know about you, but I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I'm going to let all of my past go. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There might be somebody here today. You say, Brother Rudolph, I'm having issues dealing with people. I'm having issues dealing with situations because I haven't really fully committed to the Lord. The Bible tells us just a couple of things concerning that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. The Bible says all you have to do is to confess your sin and the God that I serve is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you're not saved today, I want you to come 
to this altar. If you're not committed, if you've never committed your life to the Lord, come to this altar with your hands up saying, I, I want to be saved. I want God in my life. If you desire prayer in any way, if you would, just come to the altar with your hands lifted. My situation during the Lenten season is to be delivered from people. That may not be your situation. It might be something else. But you say, I want to leave it at the altar. Just come and leave it at the altar this morning. Whether you want to be saved, whether you want to be saved, or whether you just want to leave something at the altar. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're going through. But just come. If you could, just come. Don't worry about the person beside you. Don't worry about the individuals around you because they can't live for you. Yes. They're not going to open the door in heaven for you. You got to deal with God. Hey Amen. Just come to this altar. If you need deliverance, just come. If you just want to leave something at the altar, just come to this altar. Just leave it at the altar. I don't mind praying with you. Just leave it. Whatever it is, whatever it might be, just come to the altar this morning. Just come to the altar. Whatever it might be, whatever it is, whatever it might be, whatever the situation is, whatever it might be. My blessed Savior, I, I surrender. Come on, just lift your hands right where you are. Anybody else that wants just prayer. If you just want prayer this morning, just come. Just come. We'll pray with you. Those of you who have gone through this situation, don't you know how good it felt when you gave it all to the Lord that first time? You said, Lord, forgive me. Lord, give me another chance. I want you to be praying out in the audience. If there's anybody else here, I want you to come. Just come. Just come. Wherever you might be, whatever your desire is, just come. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, God, for this day. I want to thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to minister to this Nashville audience. Now, God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would touch every person that has come to this altar. Lord, I ask that you would touch and strengthen them now. In the name of Jesus. God, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they're dealing with. But God, you know more than anything what people are going through. God, I ask that you would touch their heart. I ask that you would touch their mind. Strengthen their spirit on today. In the name of Jesus. Devil, I rebuke you now. I come against you with the power and with the authority that God has given to each and every one of us. Touch us now. Redeem us now. Heal us now. Deliver us now. In the name of Jesus. And as I leave this altar today, I am delivered. As I leave this altar today, I do have joy. I do have peace. And everything is all right. I declare and I decree that all is well. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And it is so. And it is so. I don't care what anybody says. And it is so. And it is so. Amen and amen. Put your hands together and bless the Lord. together for the word of God. Now put your hands together for the messenger. Thank God for a powerful message on forgiveness. You may be seated. 
My, my, my. I don't care who we are, we should leave here knowing that whatever was, I'm going to use an expression, is yet in the was-ness. In other words, in the past. But we're living in the present, looking forward to the future. Thank you for a powerful message. God bless you. Amen.